sweet Holy Spirit. What we're going to do tonight is uh, be in the Spirit. This wasn't on my notes. Is there somebody here that something's really heavy on their heart that you need prayer for? We can, we can agree with you. Family matter, anything. I want to pray for the Arboros. They got a big day tomorrow. Marrying their baby off. These guys are awesome. I love them so much. They're the reason we're here. It's their fault. Terry invited us, so if there's somebody to blame, it's right there. Okay. Let's bow our hearts and our heads. Holy Spirit, you're in charge of this. I want to thank you so much for the revelation that you have brought to us. But I am so excited about the revelation you're going to bring into us. We have got leaders of kings and queens in this room. We've got the cultural changers right here in these seats. You see us as more than we see ourselves. And I am so proud of these people. I'm so honored to be in front of them and give them these words. Holy Spirit, you're in charge. And we love you. Thank you, Jesus, for being so sweet and being our example in all of this. In Jesus' name. David, are we rolling? Are we good to go? Okay. Let's do a quick review. Everybody have a handout that wants a handout? Last week and every week, we're going to talk about Revelation. What are the two keys for getting Revelation? I would like some feedback on this stuff here. It's not a trick question. It's right there. Two things. To be a what? A seeker looking for that Revelation. And then secondly, to ask. So I'm going to put it in your court right now. Take 10 seconds and ask the Lord, Lord, give me revelation. I'll join you. Lord, give me new revelation tonight, something I've never seen before, something that's there, but it just needs the curtain pulled back in the name of Jesus. And then, why do we need revelation? Okay, it is that truth that hits our heart so that our heart can change as parents, and as disciplers. We went over covenant love last week. Covenant love is 100% and 100%. There is no 50-50. There's no contract. Covenant love says we both will do it all. The reason for covenant love? Lasting relationships. Reason for lasting relationships so we can have intimacy. And the release, the reason for intimacy is to reproduce ourselves, whether it's in our children or in disciples. Covenant love, critical foundation. How do we operate in covenant love? We do as Jesus did, and he looked up, and he saw the Father. I encouraged you guys to be uplookers, looking up. Did anybody look up this week and see something from the Father? I know I did. It's life-changing. We look and see what he did. Okay? He shows us our, ident- our identity, not what the world tells us we are, not even what we believe we are, but he tells us our identity when we look up. Jesus left so the Father could send his Spirit, and that's our guide these days. Our job as parents and disciples is to reveal the Father to our kids so they can look up and they can see what the Father is doing. Does anybody, remember how last week I asked you guys to seek revelation, something personal that the Lord uh, showed you independently? Did anybody get any revelation either last week or this week from something? Nobody? Rebecca?
Mm-hmm. I specifically asked, why do I take what the children do so personally? Mm. And when you began speaking on covenant love, I was like, well, of course I do. I wasn't loving them covenant. I was saying, I'll love you if. Love you if. I'll love you if. Right. That's so foundational. And I'm so happy that you brought it to my attention. Right. That can bring so much change. For Amen. Me. And you have a grace for parenting when you realize that. It's 100% because the Holy Spirit will come in and give you that power to love them in a covenant way. Amen? All right, let's start on our first subject, and it is imagination. If I could put two foundations down for this parenting or discipleship class, I would put another foundation of imagination because nothing happens in our life unless we imagine it. Uh, David talked about him and himself imagining being married to Kim. He wasn't married at the time, but he imagined it. Is there anything in our lives that we have done without first seeing it up here? The word, the real word for imagination is conception. I want you to think about that. Conception. What are you conceiving in your mind? Is it life or is it death? Let me give you a death conception, if you will. Everything's going bad at work. They're probably going to fire me. The boss is always mad and he's yelling at the secretary. The company's closing. I'm going to be out of work. I'm going to get kicked out of my house. I'm going to da 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 that's an imagination of death, right? Uh, my kids are going to turn out because I was a terrible kid, and my parents were terrible kids, and my dad was an alcoholic, and my kids are going to probably end up in jail. That's a conception or an imagination of death. Now, let's flip that around. I am working at a great company. They're probably going to give me a raise. In fact, I might run this joint one day. Hmm, what would it be like if I got a raise? What could I do for my family? I could pay off that bill. I could get that thing. Wow, I'm going to work. Wow, conception of life. My kids are awesome. You ought to write a book. Wait a minute. Okay, we imagined our kids being awesome first. And then we put life behind it. Number one, imaginations change what is to what will be. Just like conceiving a baby needs a seed, what are you seeding your imagination with? Do you remember the story of last week where uh, Claire's mom said, my kid, my teenager is not going to be bad. She made a choice because she imagined her teenager being a good kid. Then she backed it up with words and telling her, you're going to be a great kid. But it started with the imagination. The twin sister of imagination is meditation. If imagination is the seed, then the meditation is the, de the uh, gestation period. You constantly think of your imagination of life. My kids are going to be great. My kids are going to be... I'm going to be great at work. I'm going to have a great ministry. My artwork is going to change the world. This food that I'm putting out is going to be, it's meditating on it over and over and over. Number two, meditation grows what you have imagined. Imagined. This imagination will grow in you until you either kill it with doubt or you start putting work to your imagination and it comes to life. There are two people in this room that seeded our imagination, we should write a book. All right? It started with a thought from someone else. It blew us away at first, but the Lord had given us so much insight and wisdom on children. Other people said, you, you need to put this down, imagination. Then we started meditating on it. What would it be like? And then we put work to it. And it was messy and gross and unorganized and all over the place. But we grew this child, if you will, out of the seed that started with your imagination. What you give birth to 
through your imagination is determined on what is your seed, is what your seed is based on, or, in other words, who's your daddy? Where is your seed from? Is it from death or is it from life? Are you imagining something bad? ISIS is going to come over. ISIS said they're coming over. Oh, they're going to kill us all. I better hide in my closet. I better hide it, right? Imaginations of death. The Lord is my protector. In his shadow, I will find my protection. My kids are going to be fine. We're going to be smart. We're going to have enough. Imaginations. Who is your daddy? Number three, who is your daddy? Is it a word of the Lord? Or is it fear? Imagination does not equal reality yet. This is where doubt can come in and kill it. Doubt was attacking our idea of writing a book because we're not authors. Are you kidding? I swing a hammer and she's a teacher. You want us to be... Doubt was trying to kill that imagination. Be careful when you start putting life to your imagination because doubt will come in and try to snatch it. Number four, conceive your future. All of us know the idea of conception. Imagination is the seed. Meditation allows it to grow. So what are you growing? Okay, so um, one of my, I don't know if I'd call it a hobby in my free time, but uh, I really like watching home improvement shows and, and house buying shows where they're fixing up a house. Not so much just looking at all the houses that are done, but I really like watching those shows where they walk into this house and it's trashed and it's messy and sometimes the buyers are there and you know the realtor's there and the buyers are like, oh my gosh, I can't buy this house. This is awful. You, you brought me to this house? Are you kidding me? No way. And the realtor's like, no, but look, if you just look, you can see it has these good structure. It's got good layout. We can just knock down this one wall here and it'll look beautiful. And we'll just redo the kitchen. And, and the realtor tries to put a vision of what the house could be into those people. And sometimes people can see it and they go, oh, okay, I get it. I can see that you could do that, you know. And so somebody has to come in, though, sometimes and show them. And you have to be willing to see that vision with them. Or you have a choice to say, no, I can't do that. It's a choice that they make to open their eyes, to increase their vision, and see what could be based on a few small good things, even though a lot of the house is a wreck. They can see, well, here's a good thing over here. We can use that. Here's a good thing over here. The layout's pretty good. We have to redo all the walls, but the layout's mm -hmm. pretty good. You know? And so they can see that. Um, so our challenge is to not look at all the mess, but to find the good layout or the good location, those little things that one or two things that you can focus on that are a good start that is a positive thing. And if your house doesn't look so good, maybe it's a little run down, maybe it's not exactly what you'd like, but it's what you have. Well, find the good things. Find what you can focus on that's a good thing and start from there yes. and imagine, okay, well, if I knock down this one wall, what will it look like? Yes. If I fix this one thing over here, just this one thing, it'll improve the house this way. And so it does take time. It takes creativity and you can't beat yourself up over how run down maybe you let the house get. It is what it is. Start from where you are. It's okay. Mm -hmm. That happens. You know, people buying a new house that's run down, somebody let it get run down, but it can be fixed. It's not too late. It can be remodeled. If you just use your imagination and a little bit of creativity and focus on those couple of things that you can start with. And you can do it a room at a time. Start with the bathroom. Start with the bedroom whatever that is in your family that you're not happy with, mm -hmm. 
pick one thing to work on, get a vision for what it could look like, and just take one step towards that. And don't beat yourself up over the past. You can start where you are and do one thing at a time. And before you know it, your house will look pretty good. Yes. So when I look in a mirror, I see a renovation project in progress. Anybody with me on that? Now, let's apply this to your kids. Put your mind on your kids right now as a renovation project. There are some good things in them. But I want you to choose to imagine what they could be, not what they are. Imagination is not what is, it's what it will be, all right? You've got to have hope for this. Um, this is going to be part of your homework for this week. I want you to imagine and start thinking about your renovation project of not only your life, but your kids' lives too. They may be run down. They may have holes in the wall, bad plumbing, whatever. But there is hope, okay? Because the Lord is in this. They, they are great kids. And it starts with that declaration. Your kids are awesome, just like you are. You guys are awesome parents. Even though you're under renovation, you're awesome parents. All right, we're going to move on to taking authority. And we're going to start with taking authority in the spirit. And just like it's important to do your work as a parent and take care of your family, you watch what they are doing on the computer or what they're seeing on TV, uh, it's also important to make sure that you are doing your spirit work and praying over them and working on them in the spirit before we begin anything else because everything begins in the spirit. So authority in the spirit is one of our, our columns or one of our walls. We're building this house. The, the uh, foundation is covenant love and so we're going to put our first wall up. I think we're going to add a wall which is imagination. Okay, so we're adding to, we're, we're uh, putting on a new room here. All right. Um, who do you think you are as far as authority goes? Who, what kind of authority do you think you have? If I gave you a bank card or a debit card and I said, there's $100,000 worth of secured line of credit on this, go help yourself. But it stayed in your pocket or your purse. Would that card be worth anything at all? Would, if you didn't use it, somebody answer me, please. No. It'd be a piece. Why wouldn't you use it? Why? You don't believe. I told you. Don't you trust me? There's $100,000 on there. Go for it. I don't care what you buy. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to put it right here in my pocket. It's because you don't believe. Number one, under authority. We as parents have the authority and th that many of us don't believe we have. We as parents have an authority that we don't believe we have. We're talking about the authority we have over the spirit of our children. I think many of us will raise our kids in the body, maybe even in their emotions and minds, but we ignore the spirit of the child. You guys have been given the most authority in the whole world over your children. I don't have that authority. No other leader has that kind of authority over your child or your disciple than you do. You have the authority. Number two, we are the parents of our kids in the spirit and the soul and the body. It is time for you guys to wake up and say, I'm going to take authority in the spirit of my children. You have authority in all three of these areas. Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now go and bind and loose. And what if we were to turn around and said, you know, Jesus, I know you gave me authority to bind and loose, but would you do it for me? I'm kind of busy. Or I'm not worthy. What would Jesus say to that? He says, you don't believe that you have authority, right? I want you guys to change your mind, and I want you to realize you are not only have the authority, but you're going to be held responsible because you have the authority. I'm not trying to lay a heavy down on you. 
but it is on us as parents and disciplers to take that authority. Okay, even if we don't think we're worthy, it's still yours. Number three, Claire and I regularly command, hear me, command health, protection, wealth, wisdom, and so much more on our children. I command it. This man right here, one of my good friends, he wears a badge for the city of Garland. He has authority that we don't have. And many times he commands citizens to do things. He takes his authority. You as parents must command in the spirit, health, protection, wealth, wisdom, whatever, over your kids. I found out in um, my experience in this that there, many times there is a delay. Number four, there may be a delay from time to time, um, from the time you make a command to the time you see its effects. But please know it is on the way. You can find this in um, the book of Daniel. Uh, one time he prayed and the answer came immediately. Another time he prayed, it took three weeks. All right? When we command things, over our children and over our disciples. Please know it is on the way because the Lord honors your authority. He puts you in authority. Oscar, if you're commanding health and protection over your kids, no, it is on the way. There may be a delay, but it is on the way. Amen? Idea. Has anybody ever ordered something online? Please raise your hand so I know. The hearts are still beating. Yes. David, you haven't? Okay, I'll pray for you. No, nothing, not on the internet. He's kind of shy when it comes to technology. All right. Let's say, give me an idea of what you ordered. Shout it out. Legos. Legos? Legos? That's great. All right. So you found what you wanted, right? And you got your credit card out or your bank card or whatever, and you put it in. All right. When did you own Legos? When did you own it? Oh, they never came in. Bad example. <laughs> who? Let's back up. All right. All right. Who has ordered something online besides Legos? Lonnie, what'd you order? Car parts. car parts. You paid for the car parts. When did you own it? Right then. Right. But did you have it? No. But when did, what? You owned it? You paid for it. And why did you pay it? Why did you own it? Because you had the authority in that card, right? You had cash in the bank. Parents, you have cash in the bank over your children in the spirit. You can command these things. Now, when did you get it? A few weeks later? A few days later? It took some time. If you got misbehaving kids, you can command peace on your house. You can command health on your house. But the next day, there might not be peace. But it's on the way. Because you are the authority and you commanded it. I command health over my daughter out in um, California. I command wisdom to her. And sometimes she resists that wisdom. But it's on the way. There may be some pain in between there, but it is on the way. Amen? Amen. Thank you. All right. So uh, taking authority in the spirit. Um, When you're a parent or a discipler, the goal is to pass along that ability because even as children or immature disciples, um, we want them to also start taking authority in the spirit because they also, as children of God, have some authority too, don't they? And so I'm not sure exactly where the idea came from. Maybe it was like a Bible man video or something that was borrowed. And um, my kids were running around like superheroes. And, you know, that was, you know, they were like five or six or so. And, and, um, They were pretending to be superheroes, and I thought, hmm, how can we use this to teach them a principle? And so I taught them to fight the bad guys, which, of course, all kids are, you know, go get those bad guys. But I taught them that we really only have 
one bad guy. There's really only one, and that's the devil. He is our one enemy. People are not our enemies. They might be listening to the devil. They might be doing things we don't like, but they're not our enemy. There is one bad guy, and I taught them how to punch him in the face. <laughs> they were all about, you know, punching and hitting and getting that bad guy. And so I said, well, you know how we can get the devil because he's the bad guy? You know how we can punch him in the face? We can pray against all the things that he wants to, for people to believe, all the lies that he's telling us, or when he's whispering in somebody's ear and telling them to do something bad. Every time you pray against all that stuff that he wants, you are punching him in the face. And they loved that idea because they all want what's good. They all want what's right. And so whenever we prayed, we'd talk about punching that devil in the face. Don't let him win. He's the bad guy. You're the good guys. And so we said, we're on the winning team. And here's the great part. We have unlimited superpowers. That's number one. Because we have Jesus. So number one, we are on the winning team with unlimited superpowers. And number two, every time we obey our authority, we are gaining ground. Because the devil doesn't want us to listen to our authority. He wants us to step out on our own and listen to his lies. And every time you listen to your authority, again, you're punching him in the face. You are not going to let him win. So we're gaining ground. Amen. Number three. Okay, so teach your kids how to fight in the spirit. It's number three. Teach them that they have power. They have superpowers. They have Jesus on their side. They have all the power of the Christ that he died for. So teach them to fight. Teach them to use that authority, and you can do it at a very young age. They get it. So wherever they are, whatever age they are, you can start that now. Number four. Right. And so the other thing is when they're choosing the wrong side, because sometimes they do, we can point out and remind them of it and tell them to get back on Jesus' side. Okay? We can make it right. They have the imagination and the resolve to make it right. So that was number four. Get back on Jesus' side. If you listen to the devil, okay, you made a mistake. It's not too late. Get back on the right side. Make it right. Okay? And they haven't heard the words, it's impossible, when they're young. I remember times when, I think it was especially Jordan, um, if she mm -hmm. had an owie or a headache or something, and she would pray and say, pain, go away, in the name of Jesus. And I, as an adult, wasn't raised this way. So in my head, I'm going, good luck, kid. <laughs> I didn't have that faith. But I didn't speak against it. I told her she has the power to pray against it, and it'll happen. They don't understand impossible. That's they right. don't understand, well, there's nerves up there, and they may not listen, and all that kind of stuff. You tell them they can do it, and they're like, all right, yeah. I'm going to go do it. Amen. Okay? So number five, speak words of power and life, even if you don't feel it, and watch God do amazing things in and through your super kids. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what superhero can you create with your kids, maybe with a cape and everything, if they're into that, to punch the devil in the face? So that's one of your homework. Um, off notes a little bit, little Jordan, about three or four years old. Man, that girl had some, some faith. But um, Claire and I were like laying down in bed, and she would come and jump up on the bed. And I said, you want to fight? And she said, you want a piece of me? And we're talking about a little bitty three-year-old blonde guy. And at the time, I was playing hockey and stuff. I was like, you want a piece of me? And she'd come, and she would stand on my chest, and she would jump up and then fold her knees up under and come boom right down on my chest and said, you want a piece of me? Now imagine that. And as she is praying and punching the devil in the face, it's that same kind of intensity 
These kids haven't realized that they can't do it. Their faith is pure. We as adults have a lot to learn from these kiddos. All right. Authority in the spirit, spirit work. This is what it's all about. Do we go to work to make money? Yes. Do we work to keep our house uh, together? Yes. Do we work on um, what friends they allow over, what, we, what they watch on TV? Yes. All right. These are all very important. Now let's do spirit work. All right. It's our responsibility. We have the authority. Nobody else is going to do it for us. It's on us. Just like a farmer needs to plant a seed. All right, well, let me go back to, to number one there. Number one, God has given you authority in your house, but it is up to you to take that authority and do the work. You know what? Sometimes it's not fun either. You're tired or whatever, but you got to do it. Like a farmer needs to plant a seed before he sees the harvest. You, as the parent, need to do the work or the spirit work way before you need to see the results. Right now, right now we're praying for our kids' parent, our, our kids' uh, um, husbands and wives. It's a way before we're praying for praying for their uh, grant, for our grandchildren. It's way before we're planting spirit seeds right now. We're praying for their protection, their provision, their wisdom. We're doing the spirit work right now like a farmer plants the seed in the spring to get the harvest in the fall, okay? We have to be patient with this authority, okay? Matthew 18, 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, okay? If you're not a Christian, this will sound like nonsense to you. Okay, but more than likely, you know there is a spirit world out there. If you're not a Christian in here, that's fine, all right? You don't, you don't have to be. These, these words of wisdom and truth can affect your family as well. Question number two, or point number two. So my question is, are you doing the binding and loosening of your family as spoken in Matthew 18? I think we got across the point that it's up to you guys to wake up and do this spiritual authority. So we're going to do this right now. Are you guys with me? We're going to do it right now. I want you to pray along with me here. Do you have in your notes, it says, follow along as I do spirit work? Right? Let's do that as a group, as a group right now. Let's, let's say that as a group. I'll lead and you guys just follow. Okay? In the name of Jesus and by the authority that has been given to me, I bind the enemy from any plans that he may have formed over my family. I destroy those plans and their effects. I loose blessing, peace, security, health, wealth, and all the goodness my God has for me and my family. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine your children and your grandchildren as you're doing this. This is authority taking. This is spirit work. Pray this over your family and over your wife and over your disciples and over your work. She prays it over her kids at school, her 22 um, young children. She takes authority in her classroom and over those kids. It's amazing. People will say, my kids are different this year. What's different with little, little John? He's behaving and all this kind of stuff because she took authority because it's hers. And I'm saying it's yours. Ooh, getting all evangelistic up here. <laughs> all right, we're going to move to the authority of the soul. How many of you know, can you tell me, what is, what is in the soul? Your, your will, your mind, and the emotions. Do you guys think you have authority in the soul? over your disciples and over your children? Right, so as uh, parents or disciples taking authority in the soul, we put boundaries in place to form the character of our child. 
when their character is formed and tested, then we as parents release them out into the world. They are in our environment to develop that character and it's our job to work on that. And so if it's not worked on in the home, if it's not proven, refined, taken care of in the home, then when they get out to the world, they have reality hit them. And people aren't so kind when they don't have good character and bad things happen. So which would you rather have? Would you rather work on it in your home and have the minor pain happen at home or would you rather release them to the world and see what the world has for them when they don't have a strong character? Amen. All right, the first one is called Follow the Leader. Have you guys ever seen the TV show by Caesar Milan, The Dog Whisperer? Have you guys seen that? One of his biggest things is if you're not going to be the pack leader, your puppy will. And then your puppy or your cat or whatever will start treating you like you're down here in the pack. And that's when you have the friction. The same is true at home or in a relationship with a disciple. If you're not the leader, your kids will be able to sense that, all right? And then they will try to fill that void. Every group has to have a known leader, okay? And if there's not, somebody's going to step up and say, okay, I guess I'll be the leader. Caesar Milan had it right. You need to be the pack leader. Those dogs and your children can sense if you're not the leader. Number one, if you're not the leader, somebody else will. It may not even be, they may not be getting their leadership from you. They may be getting their leadership from somebody at school. Do you want them to be the leader? Some, you know, cheerleader or something telling them how to live their life. Or somebody online, somebody on Facebook. If mom or dad's not going to step up, they're going to find a leader. And somebody will fill that void. Again, we're taking authority. Take authority. Not just sit back and say, I hope I'm full of authority. No, you go and take it. I'm the leader. I'm the mom. I'm the dad. In this. Number two, our kids can sense if you, the parent, are not taking the authority in the house. Okay? Where is that you snoring over there? Or is that that child behind? No, that's fine. It's so funny. I look over there, I see Ray, I hear snoring. It's like, man, I got to spice this thing up. Pastor is sleeping over. No, I, there's a small child over there. It's awesome. <clears throat> All right. If you're going to be passive, your kids may bully or manipulate you, right? My three kids challenged my leadership in three different ways. Jessica, my eldest, who's out in California, she was the in-your-face challenger of authority. She was about one year old. We had these blinds on our back door, and she thought it'd be a great idea to pull on them. And we said, no, you don't, don't want to do that. Why? Because they would come crashing down and hurt her. As she was pulling on them, she would be looking at us like this. Oh, yeah? I'm pulling on them. What are you going to do about it? And so we insisted, no, don't do it. And she's like, I mean, it was like face-to-face -face kind of, you know, boxers here. Well, we applied a little correction to her nether region here. And, oh, my God, you would have thought the world would have ended. Not because she's experienced a little pain, but because her authority had been challenged and defeated. Now, as a young woman right now, she's under authority. She has an immense amount of self-respect uh, self and self-esteem. Would you guys agree? Yes. All right. But we had to meet that authority. We had to meet that challenge with kind authority so that she could flourish and be the woman she is now. Jonathan was the ignorer. We'd tell him something, and he'd be, eh, 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 I'm over here, don't hear a thing you say. Anybody have ignorers? Ignorers? Okay, don't let them get away with that. You turn that pretty little face around and say, I'm the mommy, I'm the daddy, or I'm the disciple. Sometimes your disciples can be ignorers and just, oh, I didn't hear what you said, pastor. I'm going to just go do whatever I want. 
And Jordan was the toughest one of all. She was the cute manipulator, <laughs> right? Batting her eyes, daddy. It's like, okay, whatever you want. Da, 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 da. That, guys, if you let that go on, it will lead to a life of manipulation, a life of trying to get her way by using her charms. And that's not the way to lead life. You still need to have that authority. If she's trying to be cute and everything, sorry, kid, this is the way it is. Number three, boundaries are in place to form. Form, think of gold, liquid gold being poured into a form. Tell me what good liquid molten gold is. It's nothing. You need to put it into something in order for it to be used, even a brick so that you can trade it, right? Or a plate or a goblet or something, this liquid form. It needs a form to have its character in the child. The reason we're doing this, the reason we're putting this pressure of authority on them to form them, right, is so that we can release them out into the world. So that that fire of our authority and saying no will harden them to what the world has for them. You are not being mean if you are exercising your authority. You are actually exercising love by saying, I can't let you get away with this because I know what's coming and that will crush and destroy you. Let's form you by staying in these, goal, in, these, in these rules. Amen, question, homework question. How do your kids challenge your authority and how will you lovingly resist it? Homework question. All right, now a lot of times when we think about authority, it, for a lot of people, it kind of conjures up images of oppression, I'm going to take control of you, mm. and things like that. But that's not what God meant for our authority to be like. Mm. Um, even though I'm a teacher right now, my original bachelor's degree was in psychology. And as I was thinking about this concept, the Lord brought to my mind a psychology study that I had learned about in school. And um, back in the 70s, um, psychologists were thinking, you know, children just need to be free. We need to get rid of all the fences around playgrounds so that children can experience freedom because that's what kids really need. They just need to be free of all this authority and restrictions. And so they removed the fence. And they found a very interesting thing. When the fence was there, and it was like between the playground and a street or something like that, and, you know, and there was a sidewalk in the street. When the fence was there, the kids were playing on the whole playground, right up to that fence. They removed the fence, and the kids were actually less free. They were afraid to go near the street because there wasn't that boundary and that protection, and they knew it. They're like, there's a street right there. The ball might go in the street if we play over there. Somebody might fall into the street if we go over there. And they were actually less secure with the fence there. And they were all huddled around the school building, playing in a much smaller area without the fence. So much for that freedom, huh? So um, when we create boundaries for our children, we're actually giving them the freedom to know that there's safety when there's an authority there. I can depend on mom and dad to keep me safe. They're the fence. And I have freedom to just be a kid. And when they tell me, stop doing that, that's dangerous, I can go, oh, okay, that's dangerous. And there's a fence there to protect them. But then the Lord went further with that and kind of told me, well, different parents are kind of like different fences. Not all fences are the same. I'm like, okay, what do you mean? So when a parent is in control of what's going on, point one, Number one. a child is free to just be a child. Now, point two, there are wooden fences. A solid wooden fence is extremely protective and strong. Okay, would you agree with that? Wooden fence, keep out all the bad guys, you know, keep your privacy, all that kind of stuff. And some parents are like a good, strong wooden fence. The problem with the wooden fence is 
Nothing from outside can get in, but it doesn't let anybody on the inside get out either. If a kid is inside a wooden fence, how much vision do they have? They're safe. But can they affect the world? Can they go beyond that fence? Can they even see a vision for something else besides what's right in front of them? So a wooden fence is good and strong, but might be a little restrictive. Okay? It's a parent that says, I'm not going to let my kid do anything outside of our home. I'm not going to let them be exposed to anything. I'm mm. going to protect them forever. Mm. Then they'll be safe. But are they going to have the opportunity to learn to serve others, to get along with others, mm -hmm. to bless others? Then there's a barbed wire fence. A barbed wire fence is there. It keeps things out. But it will cut somebody if they run into it. Mm -hmm. Point three, a barbed wire parent might have anger or control issues. If a child breaks a rule, mm -hmm. all hell breaks loose. And the child gets hurt physically or emotionally. There's no forgiveness from this type of fence, and it leaves scars. Mm. It's damaging. Mm. It keeps bad stuff out, but is it the best kind of fence to be? Now consider a chain link fence. Okay? When it's well built, a chain link fence is sturdy enough that you could climb on it. It can hold the weight of an adult, but it's flexible and see through. Point four, a child who grows up inside a chain link fence can see and learn about the world in a safe and protected way. That's good. You're not keeping them in from the whole world. They can see beyond their yard. They can see beyond themselves, but they're protected. A good parent teaches a child about the dangers of the world and how to deal with that with, when it arises, but it's from a safe distance with that authority of that chain link fence. Yes, there are things out there that you're going to have to deal with. Here they are. You can see them. But I also have that fence to protect you. I'm here to protect you, even though you can see those things. A child can even interact with others that are outside that fence while still being protected by the fence. When you guide your kids through things in the world, it can be an ex excellent balance between protection and vision. Let's them see beyond where they are. So the question is, what kind of fence are you right now? And what are some areas that you may need to become a little more flexible? Isn't that good? I mean, just think about that. It's, I'm so glad I married this woman. <laughs> All right, next one. Knock, knock. Who's there? Leeches and weeds. As parents, how many of us come home from work or whatever we're doing tired, right? Most of us, all right? TV's on, the kids are melting their brains in front of the TV or the video game or whatever, all right? And you just want to go to your room, lay down, kick off your shoes or whatever. This is where courage meets exhaustion, all right? Number one, the problem with compromise and compromising, letting our kids maybe view something or see something online or whatever because you're so tired and you've had a hard week and it's Friday, you just want a pizza. The problem with that is it's like a leech or a weed. You go for a nice, cool, relaxing swim and then the leeches come in and just start connecting themselves and sucking the blood. Sometimes there is a time that you have to go past your exhaustion into courage. Number one, the problem with compromise is that it demands another compromise. There are standards you have set up in your house, in your life, that will be tested, whether by your children or by the enemy or by the world, but you have to have courage to say, no, these are my standards. That television show won't be on in my house, guys. That thing you're watching on the internet can't be. 
You're not going to talk that way. I'm exhausted. Please don't push me. But let's, let's turn this off and let's go talk about it. Number two, the time to fight for your family rarely coincides with your energy level. Best time to attack an enemy is when he's weak. Best time for a leech to come and latch on to your kids is when you're exhausted. You have to have the courage to say, no, Satan, no child. You're not going to go down that path. You're not going to view that thing online. You're not going to have what's-her-name in your room. Mm -mm. No, it's not going to happen. Open your eyes to what is coming into your family's house. Open it. Does this match with your standards? Doesn't matter what your energy level is. Number three, what are you allowing into your house that is planting seeds in the hearts of your children? And are you okay with that? You can also say, what am I allowing to plant seeds in my heart? Ugh. Sometimes you've got to do some weed pulling and shut the thing off and deny that leech from coming and sucking the life out of you. Number four, you are the authority in this house. Stand up and pick the weeds out of your child's heart. It is worth the fight, and there will be disagreement. But your standards are your standards. Your walls are your walls. We are pouring this liquid gold into a form, and if that form cracks, there goes your character. There goes your weakness. Stand firm. I'm just saying I encourage you that even though you're tired and exhausted, and even here on Wednesday night, you're here because you want that form firm. Question, homework question. What can you plant in your child's heart for a positive harvest? When you get home this week sometime, why don't you answer that one? Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is honor your father and mother. In Ephesians 6, 2 and 3, we are told to honor our father and mother so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Okay? Point one, James and I set the example of honoring parents as we publicly honor our own parents. My mom passed away before any of our kids were born. Uh, but I honor the good things that she did in me. And my kids know some of the great things that Grandma Barbara put into me that they are experiencing the fruits of. One of the biggest things that she said to me is, I love you always and forever, no matter what. And she said that over and over and over again. I've also passed down the skill of cross-stitching that she taught me, and I said, when I was little, Grandma Barbara taught me this. My dad involved me in working on house projects and taught me how to use the riding lawnmower and drive a car in difficult situations. I share the fond memories of my dad staying up late on Christmas Eve to make sure each present was wrapped just right. Honor your parents in front of your kids. Point two is we honor our own parents. We also need to honor our spouse in front of our kids. There are times when James has been less than perfect. And they've come to me and said, Mom, Dad did this. And I'll say, hmm, okay. I have evidence. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say to the kids, hmm, well, okay. Maybe he shouldn't have done that. But generally speaking, he has your best interest in mind, and you still need to honor him and forgive him because he's a human being. And he was a human being at that moment but he's still your father, he still loves you, he still has your best in mind, and you need to honor him, even when you're not happy with him. And so you can teach your kids that. If you are divorced, step-parents, don't talk bad about your ex-spouse to your kids. Right. There are good things about them that you can say. Yes. You can find something good to say about their parent, even if you're not with them anymore. Yes. Find those good things. Honor them. 
because that will teach them to honor that parent. Point three, the Bible does not say to honor your father or mother if they live up to certain standards. Uh-oh. It simply says to honor them. That's a choice. You can make that choice. So when we choose to honor our own parents and show our children how to honor their parents, we're an example of how to fulfill that biblical principle. Lead them, show them the way. All right, we're going to wrap up with authority over the body. We're taking all of these in spirit, soul, and body. Okay. Let me ask you a question. What's the difference between a parent and a babysitter? A parent and a babysitter. I want you to think about that for a minute. An engaged parent has a vision for the future of their child and is willing to pour themselves in to that child to make that vision a reality, imagination. They will put their time, their effort, their energy, their money. They are creating something. A babysitter's only goal is to keep the kid alive for another day. All right? So where is our authority? Where is our authority in the child's body? Are we letting someone else all right, babysit them and not form them into the person we're wanting them to be. All right. So um, I have here a, a saying, James and I sometimes in the morning, especially when the kids were little, we'd hear the kids crying in distance. We look at each other and go, oh, we're the tall ones, aren't we? We have to be the tall ones. We have to be the adults in the situation. And so... Uh, point one, they need us to act like adults, no matter how we feel, whether we're tired, exhausted sometimes, whether we're hungry. I want to eat, but they're hungry too, and they're little. I'm the adult. Take care of them. Point two, sometimes being the tall ones means we don't throw a tantrum when things don't go our way. <laughs> how many of you as an adult have wanted to throw in a tantrum? That happens. Okay. Sometimes it means being cheerful when we don't feel like it. James and I use this phrase to boost each other up and encourage each other when we don't want to act like an adult. It pushes us towards being responsible instead of running away from responsibilities. Uh, point three, being the tall ones means we deal with the problems thoroughly, even when we are tired. So many times the kids have done something, and rather than just say, Go to your room, you're in trouble. We've sat them down and we've talked to them, sometimes for what seemed like hours, yes. when I didn't want to talk to them at all because I wanted to go to bed. And, but it's what you have to do. So even when you're tired, you have to take care of business mm -hmm. and address the heart. So what are some situations in which you find it difficult to be the tall one? You're not going to? Okay. okay. Um, I know we're getting close on time, so we're trying to kind of wrap this up. Um, so we're going to kind of go through the points a little bit here to finish mm -hmm. up. Um, but sending the babysitter home, uh, point one, an engaged parent has a vision for the future of their child and is willing to pour themselves into making that vision a reality. You know, babysitter's only goal is to keep the kids alive another day. Hopefully your goal is more than that. Point two, don't rely on the TV or the Sunday school teacher to really instill the values you want your child to have. It is your responsibility to do that. Right. Okay. When I was only had Jessica, I was teaching her about taking turns. I told her that I wanted to play with those blocks. She didn't have a little brother or sister yet, so... I wanted to play with the blocks. And I taught her how to take turns before she ever had siblings. Because when siblings came along, I wanted her to know how to do that. It took time, it took effort. I really didn't want to play with blocks. But it was my time and effort to instill a principle in her. So point three, take, send the babysitter home and take the time to actively instill the character 
and moral compass your child needs to stay on the right path. Okay. And the last thing we're going to address, which we kind of talked a minute about in the beginning, is you don't have to be a super parent. Amen. You really don't. Um, a lot of the process of parenting is refining yourself. And a lot of times we look at our kids and go, oh, I don't like how they do that. And then you go, wait a minute. They're doing that kind of just like I do. Hmm. So it's okay to be human. It's okay to make mistakes. Okay. And the point one, it's okay to rest. In fact, God tells us to do it. He knows that we need rest just so it doesn't become a habit. So you're not always resting. Because if you're always resting, then again, who's raising the kids while you're resting? Okay. Number two, it's okay to hand them off to someone else occasionally so that you can have a break. You don't have to be there 24-7 to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. But when you're there, invest yourself. Even when you have a high-need child, maybe especially if you have a high-need child, it's important to take a break. Yes and feed yourself so that you can get some me time. They won't have permanent damage, even if you leave them with someone else and even if they cry the whole time. But when you're there, invest your time and energy with them. So the temptation is to continue relaxing beyond what you really need to regain your energy and make it a lifestyle of being a relaxed mm. parent. Point three, appropriate videos or TV shows are fine to give you a break. Just don't let them raise your kids. So put your feet up and relax sometimes, and don't feel guilty, even if your kids try to convince you otherwise. And then the question is, what are some ways I get refreshed and refueled so that I can be a better parent when I am with my kids? Amen. Good. All right. Imagination. What are you going to conceive that's not there yet in your child? I highly encourage you to go and write these down. My child, myself, my job, whatever it is, conceive what you want it to be. Then authority, you have authority in the spirit, in the soul, and in the body, but it's yours to take and work it and do it. Amen? We're going to close each one of these sessions with an opportunity for forgiveness. Because while Claire and I were writing this book and the Lord was giving us in this information, many times there was an offense in our heart for the things that we were writing down where our parents had failed us or a spiritual leader, a discipler. Okay? So we're going to just take just... A minute and I'd like you guys to close your eyes and I'd like you to see if there is any unforgiveness <clears throat> in your heart that you've maybe been holding on to maybe you didn't even know it that somebody misused their authority and you can choose to say I forgive them for misusing their authority or they didn't take authority I was alone looking for a leader. I forgive them. I choose to. I don't feel like it, but I choose to. Or in the soul, they weren't a leader over my emotions, over my mind, and let me just fill my mind with junk that put seeds in my heart that I'm dealing with today. I forgive them for that. I release them. Or maybe even in your body, they took authority that their fence was harsh or their fence was controlling. And I ran from that control or I have a scar from that barbed wire. I forgive. Don't feel like it. I choose to so that I can be the parent or the leader or the discipler that the Lord wants me to be. I release that. I let it go in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys are awesome. We'll see you on December the 9th. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. The prayer thing on the first 
the following deal. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And if you guys have any personal questions, Claire and I will be up here. Love you guys. See ya. Bye.